Again, welcome. Uh, making flying robots do your bidding. Uh, this, I, my name is Tim Murray, and I'm a web developer on my day job. Uh, all my GitHub, Perlmonks info, you can find me. Um, and I work for a company called Double Prime. Uh, we do mostly web development, and we are hiring. We do telecommuting. Any of the uh, dark green states, uh, we offer telecommuting opportunities. Uh, we do a lot of Perl, a little bit of uh, Drupal as well. And I was told today we were looking for an information architect in particular. Uh, so if you know anybody like that, uh, come see me. Uh, if you're just interested in developing in general, there you go. So uh, just to give you a quick taste, this is the AR drone up here. And it makes its own little Wi-Fi uh, ad hoc network. And I've, uh, I'll just have to connect it here. I've got to do that for my setup. I'll have to get out of the talk here. Always do the setup before you start talking. Right, and I'll just get an IP address off of this. I've named mine Bane of Cats because my cat is absolutely terrified whenever this takes off. There we go. So now it's connected, and we've got this UAV shell, and we can load up the AR drone library with just the L option. This is designed to work with a bunch of different types of UAVs. Um, so right now, the AR drone is the main one that's implemented. So now it's all connected and it's loaded up the right library. And we can start the video. And so we got a nice real-time video stream there. And I'll just uh, go over and start on a joystick. And we can just fly it around with that. Let me see on the real. Well, that's a lot of fun. So that's the easy way of uh, doing it here. Let me get back to my right slide. OK, so what we're not going to be talking about is the military type drones. There's a lot of uses for UAVs that are coming out uh, besides just military use. Um, Starting, maybe the most obvious one, aerial photography. This is a nice shot taken of uh, Madison where we had Yapsi in 2012. And uh, so um, getting a commercial pilot to go up in a Cessna or something like that, take a picture, that's thousands of dollars. This you could probably do, you could buy the whole platform for as much as you're going to pay a, pilot, or a commercial pilot to do that. Um, so. Another thing, storm chasing. You can, this is designed to fly right into tornadoes or hurricanes and get data. Uh, much safer for the pilot, obviously. Beer delivery, <laughs> very important one. Um, this was a bar in England, and they're right on a beach. And they decided that they're going to do this little promotional thing uh, where they'll fly a full quarter barrel. Yes, that is a full quarter barrel. There, not empty one. Uh, they got this octocopter doing it. So they'll fly either like a six pack or a quarter barrel right out to you on the beach. Anti poaching. This is uh, flying around in Africa uh, looking for uh, a, a rhino poachers uh, so that it can inform the authorities about where they are. Terrain mapping. This is a particular type of aerial photography. So this is called LIDAR and it gives you this very accurate topographical map of any region. Search and rescue, so you could swarm a bunch of these in a forest and search for somebody who's missing. Agriculture for uh, laying down water, seeds, uh, fertilizer very accurately and very cheaply. Or scaring the cat, which is always my favorite one. Uh, this is our cat phantom at home and as soon as one of these takes off he just darts from the room and you don't see him again for three days. Uh, so, just for the United States, uh, our rules for model aircraft are, has to be below 400 feet. Uh, people tend to break that one all the time, to be honest. Uh, 
Uh, the AR drone here, since that's Wi-Fi, you're limited to whatever range uh, the Wi-Fi will give you, but uh, it's pretty easy to boost the signal. Beyond that, don't, it's illegal. Uh, stay away from populated areas and other full-size aircraft. If you live anywhere near an airport, you probably don't want to be flying this, at least not above tree level, if nothing else. It has to be non-commercial. Uh, there's uh, very little allowance for commercial uh, model aircraft like this in the United States. There are waivers that you could get if you have a project attached to a local government. Private citizens are probably not going to get those on their own. Uh, there are scheduled to be new rules to come out in 2015. We really hope they've already hit some snags on that one. So we really don't know when it's going to happen or what form it's going to take. So who knows. So looking at the air drone itself, it's a quadcopter. And if you look back to the history of helicopters and other vehicles like this, uh, these have been around for about 100 years now. The reason you haven't seen them until now is because they're not stable on their own. So if one propeller is a little bit faster than another, that will throw it off. It's one side is weighted slightly more than another, that'll throw it off. And it, you have to have some kind of onboard system uh, to stabilize it. With today's microcontrollers and accelerometers and gyroscopes getting very cheap, these are now a viable kind of aircraft. And it's become very, very popular among the hobbyists. So it's got indoor and outdoor hulls. I've got the indoor hull here. I, the outdoor one would not fit in my luggage. Uh, so the indoor one has styrofoam covering over the rotors. Uh, so if you bump into anything, it's all safe. And like I said before, it creates this little ad hoc network. Um, there are ways you can get it on an open access point. It won't connect to any kind of encrypted access point at all. Uh, but there's ways you can do it. On the inside, there is a USB connector. And the official ways to use that from the company are that you can save a video to the flash drive. They also sell a GPS accessory that will give you GPS coordinates over the navigation channel. Um, I don't know of any real hacks of that. People have been thinking of doing things like attaching Nerf guns and you could fire it using the USB connector or something like that. Uh, I, I assume that if this was easy and straightforward, it would have been done already. So I don't know of any good way to do that, unfortunately. Uh, there's also forward and bottom cameras. The forward camera is 720p. The uh, bottom camera is less than that. Uh, it's mostly just for seeing what's below you and you just kind of land uh, with it. Uh, and there's also on the bottom is an ultrasonic sensor that can be used. It, 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 it keeps its altitude pretty well using that. Um, so there's also a bunch of built-in maneuvers um, that it's all on the drone itself. Um, maybe I can reconnect here and show you. A few of them. Trying to keep it away from the screen. I'm not the best pilot, to be honest. Maybe I can... There we go. Hey, you can just do commands like flip left. That's very popular to do when you got guests coming over uh, and saying, here, look at my drone. And oh, that's awesome. So there's a bunch of different commands like that that um, you know, now I got to get back into my slides. There we are. And uh, they also have a couple other ones like, uh, they're real weird names like Theta 20 Degrees Yaw. They call Roll Pitch and Yaw. They have like Theta and Phi instead. I don't know why, but they're in there. Um, so on board, you will find it's actually a Linux system uh, running uh, a lot of BusyBox utilities. And you can telnet right into this sucker. There's no password. There is no security on this at all. If you wanted to steal somebody's, it, it, all of you got laptops here, you could hack right into this. But please don't. But, uh, um, 
be showing us a DEF CON. Not likely. Um, but yeah, you can tell it right into it. There's no password. And um, it, so you, you can Trappy. get it. <laughs> eh. uh, so the flight controls go over UDP. Nav data also comes back at you over UDP. Uh, the video for the 2.0 drone comes over TCP. The original one, version 1, actually had its own little UDP thing. I have not implemented that, and I don't really intend to. If somebody else wants to do that, I'm all for it, uh, but I don't plan on doing it myself. Uh, is that right? Yep. Okay, so UAV pilot. Uh, it it wants control nav data and video, and we can do real-time video streams like I showed you before. Um, and it takes a model much like DBI that uh, you have different drivers that can all work with the same system. So you can control many different types of UAVs with it. So at the moment, uh, we have the Air Drone implemented and also the Wumpus Rover, which is a little RC car of my own uh, that I designed. I'd really like to see more be implemented in the future because there's all sorts of different control interfaces out there. And the structure of this is uh, the driver implements a lot of low-level details. So if you looked at the driver for the air drone, you'd see things like AT ref and AT config, and it doesn't really make a lot of sense unless you've gone through their dev manual. But then the control is a much higher level interface where you have takeoff, yaw, pitch, roll. Makes a lot more sense. That's what's intended to be uh, very much the same between different types of UAVs. Um, so we use lots and lots of any event in this. And there's a few different reasons for that. Um, the, uh, there needs to be a new command sent every 30 milliseconds or it stops, which means that if it hits the edge of your Wi-Fi range, it's just going to hover there. So it's pretty safe in that regard. Um, so we use any event to set up that timer, and it's also very handy for the non-blocking I.O. Uh, the nav data and the video stream are both handled that way. And what I'd like to see for events in the future is something like you can increase the throttle to lift it up until you're at this altitude. So can you get it to respond to events that way? Basics of flight dynamics. This is a little chart you'll see on pretty much any kind of uh, flight talk. Uh, roll, yeah, I can pick it up here and show you. So roll goes this way, yaw will be around, and then pitch back and forth. One thing to note, if you had an airplane like this, thrust would go forward, thrust on this is going to be up and down. And another thing is that the more energy you use doing that, the less energy it's going to have for maneuvering around since it's using the same propellers for that. Making the mic go haywire. Okay, so just getting into some of the code here. This is the driver that you're just giving it the IP address that you want. Uh, this is going to be the default, so you don't even have to pass that if you don't want to. And then you just tell it to connect over that IP address. Uh, I highly recommend using the control event version of it. That will set up for you that little timer loop that sends it every 30 milliseconds. It's going to do that, and it's going to make your life easier in a lot of other ways. Uh, but we just pass it the driver we made before, and then tell it to init the event loop. And CV here is going to be the condition var that comes from any event. The event object here is actually an easy event, which I'll show in just a bit. Uh, it's just uh, a little interface over any event that makes certain things easier. So this is easy event. Um, this helps particularly with adding these timers. And instead of on a raw any event, you would have, if you wanted to st start one timer, and when that finishes, go do, some, do another timer after that, you'd have to nest those down. With this interface, instead we have uh, this little uh, queuing. So it just cascades one into the next. So what this timer is saying is after 10 milliseconds, uh, we're going to call this callback, so that's going to be a takeoff 10 milliseconds after we connect. And then 10,000 milliseconds, 10 seconds later, we're just going to land. So it's just kind of an elevator 
program. Um, and then down here we just have our bookkeeping of an event loop and this starts the event loop running and the send here, once it gets here, it's gonna stop the whole program. So I can show you an ex example of that. So here in the first demo flight, show this, so we're connecting to the host, we're setting up the easy event object, and here we get that control, setting up the event loop for that, and then we have our timers down here. That, so we can just run this quick. There we go. And then like 10 seconds later, hopefully, there it goes. All right, so I uh, showed you earlier that little UAV shell, and that's just a much easier way if you just want to mess around with it a little bit, uh, especially with joystick and doing video output. More complicated things that are going to go through an event, there you want more of your own little script running. Uh, but it will load up whatever library you have. So there's Wumpus Rover as well, but this is AR Drone. And there's a nav interface uh, that I should show you that quick. So it's just this little SDL output, and uh, it's getting right off the drone here. And you can see the lines moving. Of that. And you've got battery life, too, is really nice. Yeah, it does kind of automatically cut off once the battery gets to a certain level. So keep an eye on that. So uh, we can dump the video to a file. Uh, this would be have a path to a file after the argument here. Uh, start video, that gives you the real-time output. There's a couple of different ways to do that. If you want to be compatible with dump video, you have to pass this to parameter. It's kind of the older way of doing things. Um, I'll get into why that is in a little while. Uh, just for now, I'll take my word for it. So what do you do if it goes horribly wrong? Um, I'll just take it off here and lift her up. Now, if this is just flying out of control, uh, what you you got to go make it go upside down somehow. And when that happens, it's going to detect it and it's going to shut it all off. So if I just take it like this, it just kills it. And if I try to do anything now. It's not going to respond. You can do whatever you want there, and it's not going to work. You have to call this emergency toggle. And now it will be able to take off again. So it's just a very safety feature. As a consumer product, this is very safe. So uh, programming a longer flight, I'll show you this one. So this we have all the same kind of bookkeeping up here. Don't worry about that. So if you look at these timers though, just getting a little bit more complicated. We have the same sort of uh, takeoff after 10 milliseconds for the first one. The second one, we're going to, after 10 seconds, we're going to yaw to the left. Negative one is going to be yaw uh, to the left in this one uh, because it takes numbers between negative one and one. Uh, for all the commands there. And then we're going to pitch downward 0.5. So that's going to pitch it forward, and that makes it go like that for a quadcopter. And then we'll roll for a bit, and then after that, it's hover and land. So I don't entirely know all the time where this script actually ends it up. So people towards the front might need to duck. <laughs> I'll try to follow it around here. I'm just going to get it away from the screen. OK. 
Okay. I'll try to flip it if it uh, gets out of control here. There. And, eh, it shouldn't head towards the screen. I, I don't want to pay for it. So, video subsystem. As far as I know, Perl has the only third party library that will really handle real time output of the video system without cheating. Uh, there is a big one called NodeCopter for Node.js that will output, it has a plugin for this to output to a browser. And then if the browser takes the fancy new HTML5 video tags, it can display the video that way. Personally, I think that's cheating. Um, what we do is it has a, what's called a pave header, which just tells us things like checksum, the length of the frame, and some other kind of boilerplate type stuff. So we parse that out, and we've, now we've got our H.264 frame. H.264 is just uh, compression uh, for video that you'd use on Blu-ray players. A lot of streaming websites uh, will use that same sort of thing. It'll then pass it into FFmpeg. This is part is all implemented in C. And that gives us the YUV channel. Now, I have probably a lot of web developers in here, so you've probably worked with RGB before. YUV is just a different kind of way of encoding color. Uh, I'm not very good with color theory. I can't totally explain it out to you, uh, but uh, just trust me on that one. And then we've got that, all that YUV pixel data, and we can throw that up on an SDL window. And then we've got our real-time output. Now, what I'd really like to see in the future is linking this into OpenCV. OpenCV gives us some really powerful image manipulation, things like detecting faces or other objects. Uh, we can also draw on it. Uh, so if you want to make a game that like uh, you had two of these and you wanted to have them dogfight or whatever, you can make that sort of game where it would detect the other one and you have a targeting reticle and you have all your data up on the screen. That's what I really wanted to do with this. I haven't got there yet. Uh, so this is just a uh, uh, more graphical description of what I was talking about before. So air drone video here will get data in from the drone. That gives us our H.264 frame. And that can be passed off to anything that implements this uh, H.264 handler role. Uh, file dump, we'll just dump that to a file, which is nice enough. You can then take that file and use uh, the FFmpeg command line tool, use that to put it into an AVI or whatever you want. That's a little boring though. H.264 decoder actually links into FFmpeg, and that gets us our YUV data. And SDL video then will actually throw that up on an SDL window. And then where we would put this in in the future is implement this raw handler here for an OpenCV converter. And then we pass that off and we can do uh, OpenCV handler, uh, a different role uh, for doing object detection or throwing up on windows or uh, doing drawing commands can all be in here. And then that ends up here. And that will take the place of the SDL window because OpenCV can do the display on its own. Uh, so. If you remember, I uh, told you a little bit earlier, there's that command for starting video and you pass parameters to it to start in different ways. So there's a couple of different ways that I experimented with to do it. The first way and most obvious way is everything's in one process. You're getting, taking care of the joystick and sending commands and getting nav data and processing video. All that happens in one CPU core, one process. Which, if you have a fast enough CPU, it's no big, no, not a big issue. I don't have a particularly fast laptop, and it seems to do this okay. But I'd really like to be able to take advantage of all those newfangled multi-core CPUs. So the first thing I tried was to pipe the video stream to a separate process. And this worked. Um, but I found there was a slight lag to it. And so I didn't really consider that to be acceptable. Uh, so my second thing was that there's a master process that opens up all the, uh, all the networking channels like you'd expect. But then you use the Unix trick of all these file handles are just numbers down below. You can pass that number, the file no, to a different process. 
it can reopen it on its end and then it's processing the video stream. That works very well uh, as long as that's the only thing you're doing. If you wanted to dump to the file on top of that, that separate process would have to take care of that. It won't do it on its own because um, the master process no longer has control over that networking stream, so it can't pass anything to that file. So that's, uh, by default, this file no will be used, um, so you'll have to deal with that you know, if you want to do both. Now getting into something a little different. Wumpus Rover was uh, something I started. Um, I had this RC car just sitting in my basement taking up space. And I thought, I should like do something with this. And what I came up with was um, the Wumpus Rover. And it's a combination of Raspberry Pi. And that's running the Perl side of thing. And then Arduino will communicate with the servos. And the reason for that separation is that Arduino has very nice libraries uh, for connecting to servos and electronic speed controllers. It's also much more real time, whereas the Raspberry Pi is running Linux. And if Linux decides it wants to write to a log file for the next two minutes, your process just has to deal with that. Uh, so that's not going to really work, especially since I want to do kind of the same thing for a quadcopter. You imagine I'm going to write to a log file and now I'm flying into the wall. Not going to work. And so uh, the Raspberry Pi end of it does kind of the heavy lifting. Uh, since it's a Linux, it can work with any Wi-Fi adapter out there that uh, Linux will run. And the Raspberry Pi also has a very nice camera module. Haven't totally gotten that part, all the kinks working, um, but it can stream the video back to the client. And then kind of the main goal, to be honest, of this was not really to build a rover so much as decoupling the internals on UAV Pilot. I started out writing this without trying not to make too many assumptions about the AR drone, but inevitably they all snuck in. And doing this uh, changed a lot of the code internally uh, so that you can use either one and it doesn't care which one you're actually using. And where I'm probably going to end up going with this is I'm just starting up a new uh, hacker space back in Madison, Wisconsin, my hometown. And we're starting up these Power Wheels racing, and uh, we just gutted this one out. And uh, I don't know if you've been to the Maker Fairs where they do the Power Wheels racing, uh, but this will probably run much the same internals uh, that we used on the little RC car. So. Things you can do in the future. Uh, there's two different libraries if you wanted to do like a Wiimote type thing. Two different libraries up on CPAN that'll hook into that. Uh, I fiddle around with them a little bit myself. I couldn't quite get it to behave itself. But um, I don't think they're actually specific to Linux despite the name here. Uh, I think they, the libraries themselves will compile on Windows. I don't know about the CPAN modules. But if you wanted to do a remote control like that, uh, those would be the way to do it. Google Voice Recognition. Um, this seems to have changed over the years a couple times, but um, it's not an official API. But the basic idea is you send a flack to this one URI that Google has, and then it gives you back some JSON of potential things that you might have said in that flack. Um, I don't know that there's a Perl module made for this, so if you're looking for inspiration for a new Perl module, there you go. Um, another cool thing, automatic stitching of images from bottom camera. This will probably be a little easier with the uh, uh, OpenCV. I think it has some things to stitch together images, but the idea is you're just flying along and below you, and it'll automatically make those into one big picture all at the same time. Now, I'd also really like to see this on Android since Perl 5.20 can compile on Android now. Um, and just really getting started on that, so I don't know if it has everything we need to do that. But uh, in the future, I really want to see these running on Android phones and even getting that uh, video output on there. And uh, because right now, your only real option is Java on there. Other things people have hacked on this. This is a taser. 
So you see, this is the outdoor hull. And these two aluminum strips here, whenever skin touches these two, it gives you a little shock. So what you do is you uh, go fly these in parks and chase your friends around, and if they're not fast enough, they get zotted. Uh, some people have noted controlling them over Twitter. I think this is a terrible idea. Um, but if you want to try it, there, go ahead. A few other hacks. Um, this is the, how you would con to connect to an unsecured access point. Um, you have to kill the DHCP server on board since whatever access point you have probably already has a DHCP server. Kill that, and then you just tell it to connect to this SSID, and then uh, you fill in a static IP address on it. Um, the thing is, you'll have to do this every time you restart it, so every time you put in a new battery. Um, there is a way to get that to script it at startup. Um, they will tell you that you void your warranty if you mess with the startup scripts, so whatever. Uh, extending the Wi-Fi range is a very popular one. Uh, some people have also put in their own 2.4 gigahertz radios. That's uh, basically what they would use for more serious RC uh, helicopters these days. And that can get uh, one and a half to two and a half mile or kilometer range. And um, you won't be able to get the video output at that, of course, but it does give you a very nice range. This is something that uh, the same company is coming out with this. Uh, they just announced it a few months ago and should be out this Christmas. Don't know how much it's going to cost or if its interface is anything like what the uh, current AR drones like. I'm really hoping they completely do away with everything they've done and re-implement it because they made some very poor choices on some of the internal implementations. Uh, and this is a very good opportunity to fix all that, as far as I'm concerned. And this is a much more serious quadcopter. This is an Ardu Pilot frame. Uh, Ardu Pilot is an Arduino-based autopilot, um, and this is one that you can give it a series of GPS coordinates. Uh, so fly it here, 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 and you can just let it go, and uh, there you are. So this is, if you wanted to do a serious commercial UAV, this is probably what you would use. This is mostly a toy. It's a lot of fun, but it's a toy. So questions? Um, I'm not sure. Oh, um, so you'd have some way of um, telling it to move while you're just moving around? Uh, there's a very, uh, I think it may actually be open uh, CV that does uh, uh, point uh, cloud tracking. For your yes, phone. yes. Yes, that would definitely be something that OpenCV would be needed for. Um, that would be very, very cool. Can you actually have the on it and can it capture on itself like other nodes? No. It's uh, very much um, uh, put a, uh, running all the uh, commands for yaw pitch roll right on your system. Uh, it doesn't really have the intelligence to do things on its own. The only thing it does have is those built-in maneuvers like flipping and waving, a couple of those. Those it does on its own, but it's just not hackable or it's just not part of the map? Part of the map. Some people have started on some uh, custom firmwares. That has promise along those lines, um, but it's just getting started because I don't think it was cracked all that long ago. So. Yeah, I think it'll lift it, uh, but it's a matter of connecting to its electronics, I guess. Yeah. Ultrasonics to detect uh, proximity down. Yeah. Is there any work on detecting proximity sideways? Um, not for this, uh, since again, this is just a toy. Uh, Ardu Pilot would definitely be along those lines. Can you use an ultrasonic or like LiDAR? Either one. Yeah, Ardu Pilot uh, gives you a lot more options that way. 
Okay. Okay, I'm going to be around. I'm going to be uh, mostly in the hardware hackathon. So if you want to play around with it, just uh, come see me in there. I'll spend a lot of time in there. So thank you. <laughs>